We have uh, Dr. John Hamry, the CEO, and let's say I'll introduce him as they're coming up on the stage. General Ron Fogelman, former Chief of Staff of the Air Force, who was only responsible for a few years of the last budget drawdown. Um, Mr. Sean O'Keefe, who was uh, Defense Comptroller and Secretary of the Navy after the end of the Cold War. Dr. David Chu, uh, who was uh, Program Analysis and Evaluation at the end of the Cold War and then had to come back and live the result with the results of the 1990s drawdown as the Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness. And chairing the panel and running the show from this point forward, uh, Dr. John Hamry, the CEO and President of CSIS, who I think all of you have seen on virtually every panel we've had up to now. <laughs> Thank you. I'll turn that over to you, sir. <laughs> That's because I didn't charge. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you for, uh, David, thank you for setting up this session uh, so very well. I think we have a chance to see the kind of the scope of this problem. I mean, we're looking at a, if we are looking at the same kind of environment that we had back in 1988, we've got a tough time coming here. And so let, let me first begin by asking, well, let me just, just so that everybody knows, I know most of you know these guys, but of course, Sean O'Keefe was uh, the Chief Financial Officer, the Comptroller at DOD during a lot of that uh, drawdown the first time, went on to become the Secretary of, uh, of Navy, uh, and so in that sense had the uh, responsibility to design the overall health of the Navy going forward. Ron Fogelman, the greatest programmer that the Air Force ever had, and that was before he became Chief of Staff and just did a remarkable job shaping the modern Air Force. And David Chu, who was my very first boss when I came to town and uh, was the head of PA&E, so he was really the architect of the, of the, of the drawdown back then. Uh, and then, of course, came back and then served as the uh, Undersecretary for Personnel, and so I'm going to save some personnel questions for you, David. I mean, I bet, but let me just start with the three of you to ask this question. How bad is this going to get? I mean, none of us really knew what, what the bottom was going to be in 88, but we were so fresh out of the Cold War, people were still pretty cautious. Uh, how bad is it going to be now? I mean, uh, you know, what are we thinking that the country wants to have going forward? I mean, we tend to be conservative, but but there's also a war weariness here. So, Sean, you start us off. How, how bad is this going to be, do you think? Well, I think the, the context. Yep. Can you turn them all on so we can? Yeah, they're on. OK. The context of this particular um, phase of where the, the overall national security agenda is going, I would submit, is not as clear as it was 20 years ago in the sense that um, while the, you're right, the end of the Cold War uh, posed the challenge of trying to define what the bottom was, but at least it did define the context of it didn't need to be the uh, force structure and capabilities that we had had throughout the entire Cold War. So the strategy was open for debate and discussion in an entirely different way. And what resulted from that, I think, immediately was, or near immediately, was the, the desert shield as a storm phase defined that in very clear ways, relatively speaking. And it gave a, a better uh, frame of reference and guidepost of exactly what kind of new world order future and strategy we'd be looking at. So what, what proceeded from there was, I would hardly argue, was, a, was an orderly drawdown, but it was one that nonetheless had a framework and a context that evolved rather rapidly relatively speaking. Over the span of two or three years, it was pretty evident of where that had changed uh, from what was a stunning development in November of 1989 when the Berlin Wall first fell to the point of conclusion of that drawdown, which was arguably in the mid-90s or so. There was at least a, a frame of reference that got more and more specific as we went along. This is a different environment. This is one in which uh, there are competing views of what the framework of that strategy ought to look like. Uh, Secretary Panetta, or soon to be, has a huge challenge <laughs> to look at uh, exactly how that framework ought to be organized to match up to, and what the force structure ought to be, in order to match up to a relative uh, threat that has been defined very, very uh, abstractly. And yet it comes to clear in cases in which we see very you know, evident circumstances in which 
uh, you know, forces deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan have evolved several times in terms of its, its context, its overall mission, force, intent, everything. So how that gets defined in the future and what kind of condition we want to prepare for is going to answer the question you posed much more specifically because much like in 1989, the, the bottom is not defined. Mm -hmm. The only issue at question is whether or not there will be greater clarity of that as time marches on here to help this particular drawdown match up to something that looks even relatively like what we saw in the uh, you know, early 1990s. Ron? Uh, I guess I would pick up on a theme that uh, Sean has relative to uh, the clarity issue. And, and one of the things that I, I think contributed to that was when we had come out of the first Gulf War, the, the uh, edict came down from the Congress that, uh, you know, new administration, it's time to do a bottom-up review. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this time we have a DOD uh, instigated or, or formulated uh, comprehensive defense review. It doesn't have quite, uh, quite the same sort of gravitas, I guess. But there's, there's two things that I think uh, are, are very interesting, back to Sean's thing. When the bottom-up review started, the uh, civilian leadership, and some of you all were part of that, uh, had not all migrated to the building yet. And so, to a great degree, the uniform guys uh, were able to set the rules of engagement in the bottom-up review. And there is this old dictum here in Washington that whoever uh, whoever's in charge of the assumptions is going to sort of drive the outcome. <laughs> and the key assumption that the military put into the bottom-up review was this two major regional contingency thing, which guaranteed that uh, you were not going to do anything dramatic with this Cold War force. It then led to years of salami slicing, you know, whether it's uh, base closure, personnel drawdowns, all those kinds of things. That's lacking this, this time, and so I think the opportunity to step off a cliff is a, even greater. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that's different, in my view, this time, is that when we did the bottom-up review, when we started the cuts in the early 90s, we had only been in the... Uh, all volunteer force for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the real impact of it had not, had not started to be felt yet. And, and almost as dramatically, uh, during the 80s, while we were still involved in the Cold War, there wasn't a real shooting war out there that was generating the kinds of uh, uh, benevolence on the part of the Congress. And I don't begrudge any of our young men and women any of the benefits that they have received over the last 10 years, but the cost of the all-volunteer force has gone up tremendously. And so here we are 40 years later, and I think that uh, I have seen only uh, references to, to attacking this issue on the margins. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that until the nation and the Department of Defense comes to grips with the fact that we cannot, the, the, the all-volunteer force, as it exists today, for the size of the force, is unaffordable. It's just simply unaffordable. And I'm not an advocate of going back to the draft. I just think that we can talk more about where this leads us in terms of assumptions about what we ought to be doing in the world and how big we have to be to do that and all that. Mm -hmm. But I think those, those two things uh, so to answer your direct question, which I saw my colleague over here didn't do, but, you know, that's the way these uh, budget guys are, you know, I, I, I think it has the potential to be a lot worse than, than we had in the past because the parameters are a lot less well-defined. Uh, we heard in Secretary Lynn's speech this morning, uh, we want to do it all. You know, we can't afford not to do it all. The question is going to be, that balance, and so we'll, we'll see. David. Well, I certainly agree with my colleagues. Uh, this is not the well-defined problem of the 1989-93 period. Uh, and I think Sean opened the door on a bumper sticker uh, way of describing it. 
as he suggested, the issue then was how low do we go? What's, as Colin Powell phrased it, what should be the base force, the yeah. minimum the United States should have? Yeah. Uh, the question now is, well, how much are we willing to sacrifice as a country to have military mm -hmm. capability? What's the ceiling? What's the top end? Uh, and as Secretary Gates has argued in calling for this comprehensive review, if you're going to make reductions of significant size relative to the base, current base budget, set aside the war costs, you're going to have to take missions off the table. Yeah. Now, I do think Ron opens the door on a prior debate that will occur, and I would broaden the charge. It's not so much the compensation of existing force the issue, it's the broader challenge, in my judgment, of are there ways to reduce the operating costs of this force before you have to turn to either shrinking its size or savaging the investment accounts in order to sustain military capability. Mm -hmm. And as Dave Brito pointed out so nicely in his introduction, we don't have the overhang of equipment bought for a larger size mm -hmm. force uh, as we did in 1989 that we can use to coast for a while. And that was largely how the defense budget was, not largely, that was importantly how the defense budget was reduced in yeah. the early 1990s yeah. as yeah. We, yeah. we basically stopped new procurement for a period of time as a practical matter. Now, we did make major force reductions. I think I would differ a little bit with Ron on that point. So the force comes down relative to the 1987-88 peak about one-third to 40% yeah. in both terms of the number of active duty personnel and in terms of uh, units of usual structure measure. I would also do one other point. Uh, the personnel cost issue today <coughs> isn't really for those currently serving. Yes, they have got, the department's been more generous for obvious, variety of obvious reasons. But the big cost changes in personnel have been, as Ron suggested, the Congress wanting to reward those who have already served. That's understandable as a matter of basic political science, mm -hmm. but it's not a very efficient compensation system because those are benefits largely received much later in life. So it's TRICARE for life, for example. It's repealing redux, for example. It's the whole question of can you collect both the VA disability payment and the DOD annuity, for example. Those may all be meritorious as gestures of national gratitude, but they are expensive. And while well, we might want 22-year-olds to pay attention to what the Defense Department annuity offering is, uh, let me tell you as an ex-personnel officer, that's not where their heart is. Their heart is in the bonus payment to buy a new car, not in whether they're going to get an annuity 20 years from now. Because most of them, of course, won't collect the annuity. So, uh, let, each of you in your own way have uh, brought up this question, people, you know, I mean, we, we were able to accommodate the drawdown in 88, well, from in the 90s, largely by living off the fat reserves we built up in the Cold War. I mean, we had, we had, had strong, they weren't, they weren't huge, but they were strong modernization programs, and so we were able to scale back, and we were able to cut back what we bought from industry, et cetera. We don't have that option anymore. I mean, we now have an aging force. So we arguably, well, I'll come back to this question about what it is that we need to be buying for. But each of you in your own way have said, you know, this is really not going to be about people. What do we do about people? And yet I would guess to say, we'd probably all say, we probably have a, we don't want fewer shooters. So what do we do? Because it's a, it's a balance here. David, you said that we got to find a way to lower the operating costs. Ron, you've struggled for years with, how do, I, what, how do I sustain a quality of life with a rotation base without putting everybody out in point and burning them up? So I mean, let's, let's drill in a little bit on this people side. What are we going to do on the people side? David, do you want to start as you started? Well, I, I would start with the way we use people uh, and the business practices we accept. Now, they're all well known and understood, and each has its defender. So let's take an obvious one. Uh, by statute, from the Congress, same Congress is generous with the later life benefits, 50% of the department's depot maintenance must be, in, must be done in government facilities. As an economist, that's my original professional training, that's a signal that that isn't exactly competitive. You've got, if, if you have to put a floor under it and guarantee somebody business, it means if there were open competition for that work, not all those people would win. Now that's a, that's a very emotional decision with the Congress. 
but it's a business practice, not necessarily the department's choosing, actually. In the 90s, right. Paul Kaminsky argued very successfully to get it cut from 60%, which was the old floor, to 50. But why do we have a floor at all? if we want to be more efficient with the operating cost department. Otherwise, as you suggest, we are going to hurt real military capability. So there are a whole set of business practices, I would say, embedded in the department, many by statutory direction, that make it more expensive to have the people or to use the people or the way we can use the people than we need to be. And how much is there? That's an excellent question. It may not be enough to get to the numbers politically the country desires, but it ought to be, in my judgment, the first payment made, not the last payment made. Yeah, I, I would pick up on that a little bit uh, from, from this perspective. And when you start to draw parallels with, with what are described as the, the issues with the federal budget, where the entitlement package you know, the entitlement port of the portion of the budget has become so large and takes on a life of its own, uh, and again, closely guarded by our friends on the Hill, uh, we have now got embedded in the Department of Defense budget our own version of entitlements, whether, and, and then they're not all related to personnel, although many of them are, as, as David has, has said, but some are these other programs. And, and they are, they have been untouchable. And I, unfortunately, because of the nature of this, being a DOD internal look, I don't think we're gonna be able to touch a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the ones that, uh, that have already been put on the table where they're out there just testing how hot the, the, you know, the third rail is, uh, things like retirement benefits and you know, maybe a variable kind of uh, retirement system, things like that. Uh, our friends who, who lobby on behalf of the service members are already up on the net. I mean, I get three emails a day uh, that are just shotgun emails going out there to old guys. Oh, do you care? You know, sort of thing. So and I, while I care, I, you know, I also see a problem here. But I'm, I also think that part of the deal is as a nation, uh, we've got to sort of figure out what our appetite is. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this debacle in Libya is, is the beginning of reining in our appetite. On the other hand, it may turn out to be such a, a bad lesson that, it, you know, that it will end up stimulating our appetite for getting engaged in places. But I, I don't think that we can get enough savings, as David, and he's closer to it, but I, I so, uh, you know, living on a mountaintop in Colorado, I, and bushes don't burn, and I don't get rocks, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, you can make pronouncements. You know, I get the early bird every day, and so, uh, uh, you know, I just don't think that we're going to be able to get the kinds of dollars out of the efficiencies we're talking about, yeah. and so we are going to have to take down force structure. We're going to have to take down people, and when you do that, you're going to have to. You know, I, we've got excess base capacity in the continental United States. The only problem there is, we all know, is every time David Berto runs a base closure thing, we lose money. We don't gain. We just lose real estate. <laughs> but you know, it's he, all David's fault. He, he <laughs> argues that he actually made to save money, but but anyway, that's my point. I guess uh, I don't think you're going to get the savings on the margin. I think eventually. Every one of these drills I've been part of for the last 25 years or observed starts out with some lofty strategy review and ends up in a cut drill. Yep. And, uh, and let me just, an observation on cut drills, you know, because I'm surrounded by, you know, comptrollers and PA and E guys. I mean, it's just like the old days, you know, I mean. <laughs> You're so nostalgic about yeah, this. Don't, I, don't I, take I, my money. Gordy Sullivan didn't show up. Take the army money. You know, <laughs> right, you know I mean, we're, we're, there's nothing changing. So but, much for being the ace programmer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think. Uh, Denial. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Reformed. But as I, as I sit out there and I, you know, I kind of look at this thing, um, I, I think that. 
there are some mission areas when each of the services, I think one of the really great moves, and, and my point was going to be, we're 20 years further down the road on jointness. Okay? So uh, an interesting aspect of this is going to be the services are going to have less input. They may, they, well, the services have as much input as they always want. They're going to have less ability to influence the, out, the outcome in this drill than they have in the past. And so, uh, you know, the first step in this comprehensive review process has been for the principals to assign to the joint staff the identification of redundancies. Okay, so that's the slickest way to do a roles and missions deal mm -hmm. that I've seen in a long time and not call it roles and missions and not get everybody all excited. But at the same time, once the joint staff declares something as being redundant, I think the services are going to have a tough time mm -hmm. fighting that. And I could mention a couple areas that were there, but I won't because I want my chief to still take my calls in case there's a Well, Ron, I, I, uh, I have a, 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 a deeper appreciation for this challenge of being surrounded by, by uh, financial types than you may think. I, I found myself in the odd position when I became Secretary of the Navy of, of you know, reading the the budget guidance, thinking, what idiot sent this, only to find my name <laughs> at the bottom of it. <laughs> so receiving your own mail is sometimes a really dangerous thing. I agree. And it, uh, it, it all depends on where you sit. There's no doubt about it. But there were, you know, just in kind of reviewing the, the thoughts on this one in particular, of what the effect is on the force and people, um, I've, I jotted down it, you know, the thought of exactly what were the four really inviolate principles that Secretary Cheney then and Chairman Powell then really reinforced with great regularity. The first one was that the drawdown had to be commensurate once we established what that floor was going to be and the base force set us free. <laughs> it, finally, it finally arrested what was a free fall. Yeah and an environment in which there were folks um, and old friends and colleagues running around Capitol Hill talking about uh, budget or, uh, or uh, peace dividends and, you know, gonna have, you know, maybe we'll plow all this and lots of other things. And as a consequence, it was just, it was open season for the better part of a year that then arrested itself based on the, on the base force concept. So the insistence that the two of them had was that everything that came forward had to be consistent with what that base force condition looked like. So numbers, what the force structure would look like, divisions, air wings, battle groups, et cetera, all had to be commensurate with that. And then it motivated some careful picking and choosing over what got retired. And naturally, the stuff that went out first were either assets that were older in the inventory or those that were designed perfectly for Cold War scenarios. So the new attack submarine, you know, that's, that was a painful one to see that go. Uh, the end of the F-15 production line, you know, it was just you know, a horror to the, to, to the guys who, you know, talk with their hands. <laughs> uh, the, the notion that we would just terminate the M1 tank line said, that's it, we've got the number of tanks you need to match up to those divisions. But those two guys supported that without reservation because it was tied to specifically how you structured what the size of the force would be. And even championed with, you know, uh, lots of determination, although, you know, it was difficult to, to do at times, uh, provisions in the uh, appropriations bills that would insert poison pill provisions that ended the line at the conclusion of X number of aircraft, ships, tanks, whatever else. It was, it was a courageous move. It was one that was, I would argue, a little bit, Ron, not a salami slice. This was great deliberation, yeah. and it was difficult. Um, and every time anybody would bemoan the fact that you're losing that great capability of the following things, um, the, the, the greatest of Cold Warrior champions, Dick Cheney, would sit back and say, they gave up the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that drove the point home of saying, this is what it's got to be. And they were, you know, unwavering on that. 
uh, Secretary, or I should say, uh, Chairman Powell, I think, inserted an extremely important backdrop of the second principle, which was, let's not, under any circumstances at any time, duplicate the experience we had post-Vietnam, in which we drew down very quickly, dropped folks off the edge, and said, you know, it's been your great pleasure to have served the nation today, and see you later. He was really, really consumed with that. And I think every general officer of that era, era were very, very articulate in saying, this is a legacy we do not want to see ever repeated again. And it started the very environment we just talked about. Not with the intent of saying, let's reward those who have left uh, more than you know, what you're going to do. Is originally the idea is, and I'm sure David you know, remembers this as, far, as, as clearly as I do, was looking very specifically at what recruiting objectives and what retention objectives we would in enforce for the purpose of retaining the folks that were in the skill sets you specifically wanted. And for those who did not, and for those parts of the force structure that did not support that angle, that they got the thanks of a grateful nation on the way out the door at the insistence of Chairman Powell and all of his colleagues. I think that was a very, very powerful shift of the mindset that occurred at that time that said this is not numbers, this is not just inventory. These are folks who have actually put themselves on the line. We had the Desert Shield, Desert Storm experience to, to demonstrate it very clearly. The third one was that whatever size force you get, whatever that base force would turn out to be, that the readiness objectives be maintained at the highest possible levels. And this begat the very era, I think, that David's alluded to in the door he opened, that the operations costs now have run entirely different than what was intended at that time. But with a noble objective to say this is where we're going to go. And then finally, again, the, the investment portfolio, as, as everybody talked about, the procurement holiday that occurred. If you go back and inventory a lot of that, what, basic, what ended at that time were, again, assets that were either retired from the inventory and the new procurement that was discontinued were those that were perfectly designed for a Cold War scenario that didn't exist anymore. That was the dominant savings that occurred there. Every other asset, F-16, procurement, et cetera, all the different uh, programs that, that were in support of the wings, the divisions, and the battle groups that had been determined to be the size of the force continued along. So it was not a complete cratering of the procurement investment portfolio at the time. It just had a lot of visibility over the things that were discontinued. And yes, there was a living off the inventory for a period of time which did not require the same volume uh, of procurement and assets replacement. So it, it, the overriding backdrop, I think, was the, the treatment of the force and how you conduct that drawdown. And it has become, this objectives we've just talked about here, of misplaced focus on uh, rewarding those who have served, which is noble, and again, an important uh, kind of uh, American value that's being exemplified here, but exceedingly expensive. And we missed the original point, which was retention and recruitment of very specific individuals. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a different formulation today that turned into something that was never done at the time. So each, each of you uh, have done a lot of budgeting programming. <clears throat> and as you guys know, well know, our audience probably doesn't know as well, that We've got two budgets in DOD. We've got a budget that we manage centrally, procurement, R&D, you know, and then we've got a budget that we don't manage centrally. It's the, the operating budget, which is really, you know, you hand the money out and you kind of think you can track it, but you can't really track it. And of course, that's, that really creates a, an asymmetry at times like this when you have a build down, because when you've got to put real dollars against real things, you know, it's, you, can, you can cut F-16s, or you put a wedge, you know, against O&M, and of course you never know if that's real. So, yeah. what, David, do you start with this? I mean, what, what would you do? Mm -hmm. I, you, I know you wrestled with this. You wrestled with it when you were PA and E, and you wrestled with it in your last job. <coughs> what do we do about this fact? Because we now need to manage the unmanaged part of the budget, and we don't really have the tools for it. What, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Well, I do think something which Sean led in the last drawdown period. Uh, ought to be considered more widely applied, and that is, can we create within the department more, uh, I hesitate to use this phrase because it has the wrong kind of, more business-like organizations. So mm -hmm. the whole idea of working capital funds of various kinds uh, mm -hmm. did bring, in my judgment, a somewhat more efficient use of 
operating monies in that period of time. So the notion, for example, that when you had a depot reparable, you didn't just turn it in, you sold it back and you had to buy one out of your operating monies brought greater discipline. Now, the force is clever. So this is a multi-sided game. <laughs> Uh, and if you price the exchange wrong, as you know, people went out and started their own little depots in their service backyards. And, uh, a whole host of management challenges make that work. But I think the more you can bring business practices to bear on those parts of the fence operation where they won't, where they will net do good, because in some areas they might do harm, uh, the better off it. Take communications, for example. Department provides most communications stay free to the user. There's some exceptions to that statement. There is some dissa pricing out there, but not much. That leads to everybody wanting loads of information. If there were some way to get the users to understand this ain't free, and we have to invest in this, in the capacity and the ongoing maintenance and so on and so forth, you, I think you'd see people be a little more efficient about how they behaved. And so, as a starting point, I'd start asking, where can you replicate, wh what kind of incentives can you put out there where the incentive, as you suggest, in the field aligns with that of the headquarters? Mm -hmm. You know, only 10% of the servers in DOD are operated by DISA. Think about that. I mean, we've, for 25 years, we've made them the steward. central communication steward, and they only own 10% of, of, the, of the servers. Mm -hmm. And our average utilization rate for servers is 28% of capacity. I mean, there's, there's, something's wrong here. I mean, yeah. clearly, Ron. Uh, I would, I would take a little bit more of a maybe a tactical approach to the to the issue in the sense of um, if you if you look at the O and M budget, which we're, is really kind of what we're talking about at this point, and you begin to break it down, uh, there's a couple of things that have happened to it. Um, some of these entitlement programs have migrated into O and M. Uh, so you got to you got to be careful about you know how big is this pot and what's it being used for, and particularly the biggest one and the growing one is the health care that that's funded out of out of O and M, uh, and you know the numbers you see there are kind of horrendous. The other thing is that um, for at least two of the services, and it's true to a lesser degree for the other two, but for the Air Force and the Navy, uh, the energy costs are are really horrendous, and, uh, and so I think that uh, while it breaks a paradigm, uh, we, we have, and, and there's no experience like, uh, you know, uh, sailing a ship and, and being at sea and doing these things, but, and the same thing with flying airplanes, except there, there is, and I think in the future, as we look at these, uh, these aircraft that we're, we're buying, fifth generation kinds of aircraft. We, we have got to do a lot more of our training in simulators. Uh, one, because the systems are gonna have to last longer. And, uh, and the other one is just, just the cost of operating. Now, <laughs> the problem with that in some cases is if you don't watch it, the simulators cost more than flying the airplane <laughs> because uh, we decide we wanna have such a high degree of fidelity. So I think we have some of those kinds of things that we should be looking forward at that we're, we're not. Uh, an, another one, I'm, go, I'm gonna, you know, because uh, I'm sure I'll get another opportunity, but, but I'll come back on the, uh, on the personnel costs again a little bit. One of the things that I think we, another paradigm that's changed since the, uh, the early 1990s, the late the 1980s, is the, is the way the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve and uh, Army Reserve and you know and all that the way they have stepped up, mm -hmm. uh, but as we have as they have done that, the old they they only cost a third of an active duty person is kind of out the window because uh, right. they've they've uh, gotten I mean if you're working every day you get paid every day kind of thing, yeah. but I think going forward. We, we need to look at smarter ways or, or recognize what they've demonstrated uh, and then recognize that there's an opportunity here perhaps to, to make better use of Guard and Reserve Forces going forward. May even be better ways to organize them. You might even ask the question, you know, do you need both a Reserve and a Guard? Uh, given the Homeland Security issues, 
you know, is the paradigm maybe more of a guard thing with your Title 32 title? Yeah, I don't know. These are some issues. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Sean, did you want to yeah, I, I I just, just pick up on two points I think that were raised very uh, succinctly here that I think are, are really going to be huge cost drivers. The first one is uh, just the proposition. I think David opened the door in terms of the discussion of how you employ business practices. The wrong implementation turns out to be worse than if you never touched it. And uh, the, uh, the federal government has a unblemished record of adopting best practices from industry just about the time industry are abandoning them. So I mean, it's just, it's just there's a perfect correlation to this. Uh, and even in terms of language and terminology, it means totally different things. The term sunk cost in corporate finance means you've already spent that, it's a waste, it's time to stop the bleeding, discontinue it and call it quits. Call it a loss, period, walk away. Sunk cost in public finance means we've already invested this much, we can't walk away now. So the terminology used, particularly now, which we're about to see a perfect storm begin to develop, is at the same time that there is a, a rationalization, if you will, of new starts and whether or not you really need it, how you define what the mission objectives are, which therefore causes delay, everything pushes to the right, it means we spend a hell of a lot more on modifications, upgrades, band-aids, et cetera, on assets that are really ready for retirement. And we're about to do that. You can see it already built into the budget scenarios. The only thing that's going up is operations. <laughs> you know, it's the cost of personnel is, of course, unless there's a major force factor change, but it's the only thing that CBO and everybody else is projecting as it's going to go up by a factor of 5 6%. And that's the scenario we're about to see play out, if we're not really careful, is the, the insistence that, no, we're not going to start anything or not think about anything, or acquire whatever until such time as that's verified is we'll continue to operate assets that are really, really quite uh, well beyond the service life and putting more into it is the public finance definition of some cost. It's going to be a real disaster. Second scenario that I think that, that Ron raised that I think is important is how you use the total force. That's a, it's an extremely important point. The, the overlay, though, that I would differ with you a little bit, Ron, is that in these last few years, we've used the total force in ways that certainly were des designed for that purpose. But even in, in an area that you're extremely familiar with on airlift mobility and so forth, two thirds of that is operated by the Guard and Reserve yeah. and operated today at rates that are commensurate with what you see of active forces. Now, how much longer we're going to see people who are willing to walk away from their day job, as it were, for extended periods of time and then be able to return to them, maybe a diminishing margin here. And it's going to be a very much harder situation to, to work through. So I agree for a little bit different reasons that Ron's point is dead on. We've got to really rationalize what, what the total force is going to look like, how we're going to you know, assign those missions, and that in turn may open the door for active force as well as total force reconsideration of what that may look like. But it is clearly not going to work the way we're doing it right now. This, is, this can't sustain itself. There's no way. And uh, we're going to come to a point where we're just not going to find ourselves in a position of supporting the force that we have today if we maintain the current rate of operations now. David. I, mean, I, know, I, I, I would not be so pessimistic whether it's the right thing to do or not is another matter, but I would not be pessimistic about our ability to sustain significant use of the Guard and Reserve. Uh, what's interesting to me is that in this last decade with very heavy use, use that in some cases you point out parallels the rate of deployment for active duty personnel. Mm -hmm. Guard Reserve retention rates have stayed up there at peacetime levels, and they are all volunteers, and not actually a great compensation expense. I mean, some additional money's been spent, but it's not. Uh, all that extensive. So what we have developed, to the great credit, I think, of the service leadership and the Guard Reserve leadership, is a way to reach Americans who want to serve, oh, yeah. oh, but yeah. not 20 years in a row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the other thing finding, which Rand's research points out, is that many are actually paid better on active duty. In the essence, the old model, which was the Guard Reserve was the second job, has been reversed. For many of these people, for professional pride, patriot, et cetera, 
the military job is really the first job, and they more or less sustain themselves and keep their families happy, which is, I think, the larger issue, actually, it is. with <laughs> their, right. quote, civil employment. Right. Now, there are exceptions to that statement. But likewise on the employer front, yes, there are some employers that are disadvantaged by this, but actually, and the UD has looked into this, the average cost of employer for, quote, losing someone to, to mobilization is actually quite small. There are some some small businesses, mm -hmm. some of the law enforcement agencies, a little different situation. Yeah, but in general, same. I would disagree with this. this is sustainable. Now, whether we want to sustain it, well, that's what Ron's question is right now. I would like to pick up, if I may, take one more minute on Please. Ron's uh, being too self-facing, saying it's tactical. Uh, I think he's right. You're not going to address these operating cost problems, in my judgment, by believing there's one grand policy the secretary could sign in a single-page memo and you'll get there. There's a series of issues. He's touched on health care costs. He's touched on training. Training is a big one. Mm -hmm. and not just flight training, but all training regimes could be re-looked at in terms of could we do this in a way that's actually friendlier to the student and attracts more people to want to serve and to take the necessary training with modern technologies, the kind of asynchronous distance learning that is possible, but we don't use to the extent that might be feasible. So I think part of the answer on the operating cost side is understanding it's a series of significant issues, no one of which is a panacea. Let, let me go back to a controversial issue which we talked about very early, which was, uh, and Ron, I think it may have been you that said that the all-volunteer force is unaffordable going forward the way we are right now. Um, we're not going to go back to a draft. The country isn't ready for that. And of course, the, the hard part about uh, any military conscription program is how do you find a fair way to only draft 15 percent of the cadre? You know, we, we, we've, usually rich people get out of it, poor people can't, I mean, that kind of, so we've never found a fair way to do that. So we're probably going to have an all-volunteer force. But if it isn't affordable in its current form, we've got to think about some new things. Now let me take your mind to back in time, Ron, you and I were there at the time, I think it was on the edge of you guys, when uh, Carl Mundy very provocatively suggested that he wanted a Marine Corps of more bachelors. Now that was <laughs> controversial at the time of the, of the Clinton administration. He didn't say it that bluntly, okay, so <laughs> Carl, forgive me. But, um, but let me just be honest, I mean, it's expensive having a married force. You know, you buy housing, uh, for families, you have daycare centers. We've got 350,000 kids in daycare, you know, in DOD. You know, I mean, it's, you know, now there are downsides with a bachelor force, you know, I mean, such as drinking and accidents and all kinds of stuff, you know. So there's a trade off here, but I mean, should we put that issue on the table? Do we want to set more of a tradition towards a bachelor enlisted corps for junior ranks? I don't know how you could practically do it. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not, uh, I'm not sure uh, that it's a, uh, you know, as I remember Carl's uh, model and, and Chuck Krulak, and I used to talk about this all the time, is, uh, you know, the ideal enlisted troop for the Marines was, you, you know, you get them when they're 17. That's right. You know, they're, they're full of, uh, you know, lots Testosterone. of pep and energy and all that kind of stuff. And you, you train them, and you teach them that their job's to rush up that hill and, you know, do that. And uh, that works pretty well for that first tour. And maybe even a little while into the second tour, but by the third tour, this guy's saying, you want me to do what? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I think all the services have become much more technical. The, the whole issue of once you, once you recruit them and train them, we think it's more cost effective to retain them. And maybe it's because we don't look at the total cost of retaining them, you know, with the, with the families and everything. But um, I, I think that, if, you know, from my perspective, if when I say I think the force is unaffordable, I think it's unaffordable at the size it is and with the mix it is. And, you know, the way I would try to attack the affordability thing is, one, I would like to get the national uh, command authorities to sort of tell me what they think from a strategic perspective, 
what's our appetite going to be going forward? Yeah. Uh, are we going to, every time there is an incident somewhere or other, are we going to try and intervene in that, or are we going to let things, uh, you know, sort of lead the world on the, on the big issues and let the world sort out some of the smaller issues sort of thing? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you had some clarity on that and some agreement, and I recognize it's hard to keep that over succeeding administrations, then I think you could go to a situation where you had a smaller active force and you could better utilize the Garden Reserve, you know, in a way that uh, would, and, and quite frankly, I think this, the idea that DOD is moving away from the two major regional contingency uh, assumption, yeah. which was really what gave us the base, sure. base force in yeah. a sense, but it also locked us into something, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think gives us some new, new latitude, if you will, to look at. Yeah. Uh, what the force force mix will be, et cetera. The other thing that I don't think, be, because it, it, you know, for a lot of time, for a lot of uh, a period of time, um, the idea of true jointness was sort of lip service, and you know, we'll do as much as we have to to get along. You know, the idea that that I would depend on somebody else for, you know, close air support or something of that nature if I were an army guy or Marine, I think that I think some of those barriers are being beaten down, mm -hmm. and, I, and I really do believe that there's still uh, mission capability to be sustained with joint capabilities. That some people can give some things up, some can take them totally off their chores list, and they'll get mm -hmm. done. Okay, let me open this up for <coughs> to the floor for. Questions, comments, right? We'll start right back here in the center. Rose, to stand up so that they, that the people with the microphones know you. Yep, she's coming right behind you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yone. I'm from Mitsu and Company, Japanese Multinational. First of all, thank you so much for uh, Pentagon's or uh, PACOMS and the USJ uh, forces in Japan's support for disaster relief. Uh, it was so uh, impressive and so quick to. Uh, return the uh, Japanese uh, uh, Tohoku infrastructure back to normal. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, your drawdown uh, implication to uh, your foreign presence and uh, operational cost for disaster relief and uh, collaboration with uh, uh, R&D with international partner. What kind of implication this drawdown could be made? We, I, I don't you. think we heard the last part of your mm -hmm. question. Hold it just a little bit further away and speak a little louder. Okay. A question is about the uh, possible implication of this drawdown to uh, foreign presence of military, U.S. foreign presence in military, like uh, forces in Japan, and also um, the disaster relief operational cost and uh, collaboration with the R&D, with international partners. The role of allies. And mm -hmm. Well, uh, especially in, it, would we pull back yeah. from Asia? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, make, I'll take please, a shot. Please, please. <laughs> Not only do I live in a mountaintop, but you know, kind of like living in the Holiday Inn or whatever it is that makes you the smartest guy in the block. I <laughs> Hell, I just been to Asia, you know, <laughs> ten days, but it was a fast trip. Um, and uh, and, I, and on that trip, I spent a fair amount of time in China with uh, senior retired Chinese folks, and I stopped in Japan and spent some time with uh, retired uh, Japanese uh, senior officers. And, um, and so in, prepar in preparation of that, I had to kind of take a look at what our, our government is saying about Asia right now. And, and I, don't think that, uh, <clears throat> I don't think that you're going to see us uh, in backing away from our Asian uh, commitments. If anything, they're stronger. There's been sort of a renewed uh, reinvigoration, if you will, of these, of, of these things. And so... Uh, I think that uh, that you will continue to see uh, force levels uh, generally on the same level. Now, I have one object. I, I have one. You can't do one of these things without making somebody mad, right? So, uh, so I'm. There's one notable exception to force structure in the Pacific that I would change if I had the ability to change it, and I base this on my knowledge of the war plans and where they get utilized, and that is we have had this festering sore 
uh, over what to do with the Marines in Okinawa, okay? We ought to bring the Marines home, okay? And because you've talked to a series of commandants and the sole rationale for having those Marines in Okinawa was force structure. If they brought them home, they would have to take them out of the force. But well, we're about to go through some force structure reduction. We have an op opportunity here to do something that would be good for a lot of people. And I'm not just picking on the Marines, but we have a problem that we have turned into a festering long-term problem. But, but in general, I think everything I've seen and heard, and you know, when you talk to the, se the retired senior uh, Chinese folks, this is not unexpected that the U.S. wants to maintain its presence in, in, uh, in the Western Pacific. And I, it, you know, to say that they accept it may be too strong, but, but I don't think they're, they're gonna resist it kind of thing. But if, and if, if, if I might- uh, I know I, you were there a month earlier, so you're, you're smarter. <laughs> no, 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 I, but I would like to, I'd like to, if I may, just uh, you know, paint it a little bit more around the edges of yeah. the canvas on this. I mean, I think that, that uh, the, great, the great security challenge we're going to have, I think, uh, over the next 20 years is finding a stable security environment in Asia. Yeah. Uh, China is rising. Uh, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. But, but everyone in the neighborhood is nervous about it. And what makes it tolerable is having the reassuring presence of the United States as a force in the region that's not interested in territory. It isn't fighting over any territory, it's not interested in territory. And it has the capacity then to be a stabilizing presence. Uh, I think we have to be very careful during this period not to create uh, power vacuums. And I think that this is more a case, frankly, for in the South China Sea, and more a case for our maritime operations and our reconnaissance operations. So I think we have to maintain that. And if, if there are to be changes of the magnitude you're describing, uh, Ron, I, I think they ought to be done in the context of a strategic assessment of the yep. whole region. And when we do that, then I think it's possible to, to make a dramatic change of that nature if that's what we conclude. Be, but it, it really needs to be done in the context of this geo, geopolitical uh, uh, framework, which is potentially unsettled uh, as we're seeing China rise. And they're feeling us out. We're trying to assert a, a, a relationship with them without it becoming tense and dangerous. And I know you understand all that, and that's just I just want to make sure we rounded out the conversation yeah. in that way. Kim Wintup, we'll put on here. Yeah. Thanks. It, it appears that the budget process will precede any strategic readjustments with the debt ceiling reductions that are likely to occur pretty quickly. Rather than the what you would do, tell us what you would recommend about how you would do it. Would you stay within the normal budget process and just hope it's going to come up with the right reductions? Would you try and come in from the outside somehow? How can you get it done in a reasonable period of time before the budget completely overruns whatever strategy we have? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and start I, I, this. <laughs> in this respect, I think Ron's assessment of uh, that he very boldly asserted that this is going to be a real wreck, okay, yeah. <laughs> without reservation on that point. This is the scenario that creates that. Yeah. I mean, exactly as you just framed it, Kim, if there is not a strategic framework to this, that's what will happen. You'll get a process takeover. And, uh, I, I, you know, the, 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 the building is structured for serving the process is always way out of whack relative to what the objective was. The process is supposed to serve decision making. And instead, in the absence of any strategic framework, it will go on. And that inertia will produce the kind of wreck that I think uh, Ron yeah. very accurately predicts as a case. And it will be as a consequence of that. So it is um, a tremendous burden on the department's leadership just coming in to really set that and you know, establish what that strategic framework is going to be as early as possible. Absent that, 
This is, this is going to be a, 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 a programmer, bean counters, everybody in the process frame driving the train on this to meet a number. And the number will be passed down and it'll go through its usual cycle and that'll be how it works. Could I, could I jump on that too? Because I, I think the real problem. If, if somebody feels uh, a false sense of pressure to make decisions, you know, to drive this thing to conclusions, too early, it, it's just going to exacerbate this thing. Uh, I mean, you know, the FY12 budget is, you know, it's it's out of there. Uh, yeah. You're going, you're you're going to be able to marginally probably impact FY13. Although I'm I'm sensing and hearing that that's where everybody wants us to kind of roll mm -hmm. in. Well, you know, there's there's not enough time to do it in a deliberative fashion. So this is one of those things where you would almost be better off if you could get everybody to get in a room and say, okay, you know, 13 is going to be our transition thing. We're not going to have the strategy. We're going to kind of let it go on autopilot and, you know, whatever. But by golly, by the time we get, you know, out there to FY14, we're going to have a new strategy. We're going to understand what we're doing. But, but I don't know what the pressure, I suspect that as Secretary Gates gets ready to leave, as the Chairman, as Mike gets ready to leave, you know, they want to they leave their mark on what's coming down, down the road, and... And, uh, and a looming election. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's coming up. And, and you have, I think you have this natural tendency to try and, you know, build something, but if you build it, it's going to be built out of paper, and it's going to be blown away within a few years. And, yeah going to screw things up. So I would, I would hope that somebody would step up and say, let's do this right, you know, and uh, hopefully, I don't know, you, David was always the guy who, you know, had his hand on the TNT plunger and, you know, so, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he probably uh, can, has a different perspective on this. But. Did you want to comment on the process here? I think maybe I should pass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no pun. Well, I think, but I think to, to your point, again, right, this budget is, is, there's not much we're going to do on this budget in front of the Hill right now. At best, we're going to get a, I think most likely outcome is going to be a CR, which is a $26 billion cut against the president's submission. The, the chance you really have to shape this is going to be in the budget that comes up in January. And you know, you and in that time, you've got to define as strongly as possible what it is the rationale you Absolutely. think you're planning yeah. for. Yeah. And I think that what's missing right now is is you know, we what are we really trying to plan for as a defense department right. that's good for thir 20 years? You know, are we are we just going to get the hell out of these wars and then never fight them again? Yeah. Is that what we're going to do? Or are we? What are we preparing for? That's going to have to be mm -hmm. the framework of. That's what I think is the work of the next six months. Yeah. Let me go back here uh, in the center, and then we'll come over here. Uh, Gene Renuart, former NORAD Northcom commander, now at BA Systems. Great to see all of you. David, you're looking pretty spry there, buddy. Um, two, two gorillas we haven't really talked about in this discussion, and they influence heavily, and that's OMB and Congress. And there's an education piece that has to occur in order for them to buy into this process. Um, do we see that there is the kind of engagement that's going to take to convince Congress to give us this space to, to put the framework over top of this, or are we going to get steamrolled by Congress and it then kind of doesn't matter what we think, we're just going to be issued a solution? Yeah. <laughs> Which one of you guys wants okay. to shoot yourself here on this one? I, I, let, me, let me touch on the OMB part first. I think this is the Defense Department uh, and OMB have an extraordinarily unique relationship uh, that doesn't exist in other agencies. Having served in other agencies, I can attest to the fact that it is very different. Yeah. Uh, it is a very collaborative approach. They are, it's part of a joint review. I think it, it was very successfully managed in terms of that objective. The top line is set by the leadership. There just isn't any you know, uh, argument about how that frame of reference works. And once established, that's what everybody falls to. Now, are there procedural fouls from time to time? Sure. Uh, but it, 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 by and large, it is a very collaborative relationship. I don't think there's a lot of reintroduction of issues or education need to be done there in terms of the national security division itself. 
That's been a timeless, long-standing kind of relationship. Now, whether the budget director himself has a different direction from the president, uh, that's going to be revealed in a different context of what the top line will look like. So that's the only wild card on that piece of it. Congress is entirely different manner. I mean, it's just, you know, I, there is, and, and it, I, as much as I, I respect and admire Ron's uh, sense of order that will be necessary in order to really lay this out, I don't think they can afford the time. Yeah, I really don't. I think it, this, is, this is something that I, I think John's dead on. If there isn't some very clear frame of reference of what the strategy direction is released in January, consistent with the release of the budget this coming year, in the, in the beginning of what's going to become the hellacious you know, campaign season, uh, this could be a real wreck. And I just don't think they have the luxury to say, everybody's going to take a time out for a year, we'll see, it could come yeah. FY14. This is a collision of the highest order because you've got 535 folks over there, and every one of them think they're in charge. All right? And they've got every different idea how to do this. And it's, it is a very different kind of scenario over there. So if this isn't a, a clear you know, uh, lay down of exactly what the, and again, it would be, be objection by lots of folks, to plenty of people who argue with it. But if you don't have some benchmark to work with, you don't have some lightning rod that can be struck uh, to, to start this through as part of the, the strategic framework, this is going to be a real tear up. There's no doubt about it. It'll be random. And, and I think to, the, to DOD's credit, what I'm seeing is that they're very much cognizant of that. And, oh, yeah. And they're, yeah. they're yeah. trying to move in that, yeah. in that way. And I, I just think that with a leadership transition and, yeah. and, and all the things, it's, it's really going to be difficult. It's going to be extraordinary. extraordinary. And when you start to look at who the, who the drivers are going to end up being on this thing, uh, you know, got, you've got your old organization, and they're one of the designated to keep. Uh, you got policy, so you know there's some stability there. Mm -hmm. um, the services, uh, with the exception of what the army's going through now, with you know a chief that moving very quickly to be the chairman, and and again the chairman and and the vice, the whole joint staff. Uh, that's another part of the dynamic that I don't think was there back in our day, not nearly as strong, although tr truly Colin Powell understood mm -hmm. and did drive the, the bottom-up review in a, in a way that a few, few chairmen uh, would have or could have. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you that, you know, as much as I would like to see this done in some larger national perspective, mm -hmm. I think DOD is going to do the best they can to get something over there. And, it may be the, the right tactical move. David, any comments? Right back up. Yep, yep. Uh, Chip Pickett. Uh, I'm an ROTC uh, student with uh, David over there. That tells you how old we are. Uh, this is like a gathering of great pessimists. Um, and, the, and the real question that seems to be on the table is how bad it's going to get. Let me put it to you another way. There's a difference between what went on in 1985, 1995, and what's going on today. And the difference is that the size of the numbers in, 19, in the 1980s were only measured in a few hundred billion, and the point, finger was normally pointed at defense. Today, the administration's talking about how to, how to take $4 trillion out of $14 trillion. And one of the most intriguing aspects of this is the way they're changing the entire debate it's all about national, about the debt now, it's not about deficits and so on and so forth. So let me ask you this, what's the possibility that the problem is so severe that in essence defense gets nicked, it doesn't get hammered, because principally in order to deal with the problem you've got to go take on a whole series of problems that are far more severe and far more, and, and far more likely to create political problems in the United States. Uh, and in that environment, uh, the constituency that actually believes in strong national defense, how big or how small, so on, but that constituency is strong enough that falling off the end of the cliff, which is a term you use, is, in fact, is something that in fact doesn't occur just because the numbers are so bad nobody can master them. I, I, me, yeah, go ahead. Let no. me take a crack at it, uh, Chip, because I think you make an excellent point. The real debate, real fiscal debate is over the so-called entitlement programs, 
and the larger federal budget, not defense. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the difficulty, however, is twofold. Uh, and, and I give credit to Doug Ammendorf of uh, the Congressional Budget Office, who has given an excellent talk that makes this point. If you look back over the last 50 years, in other words, since the end of World War II, as far as federal budgeting is concerned, the, the headline story in terms of purpose is we've reduced the, the burden of defense over time in order to have social transfer programs, keeping federal expenditures as a share of gross domestic product, roughly speaking, the same until very recently. That's over as a mechanism for expanding social entitlements. Sure, sure. And that's the problem. That's the central problem. The, the, the downside is defense gets crushed in the process of redoing that, that, that social bargain. Uh, moreover, the problem is, well, I think all three of us are agreeing this afternoon, is the margin in defense to make adjustments without giving up a significant amount of American ability to be effective in the world. The question about the Pacific, for example, specifically, is so much smaller than it was in 1989. Yeah. In 1989, we had built a force to deal with a competing world power, as we all know. The world power disappeared. So the question became, well, OK, what do we have to keep around? What's the base force? Mm -hmm. Now the problem is we have all these challenges out there. Ron points out we don't have to take them all on. But nonetheless, there are going to be challenges out there, challenges in the Pacific. How much are we willing to afford as a country to keep? And I think that's where the train wreck could occur, mm -hmm. that in the commotion over not wanting to give up various other federal programs and not willing to see the tax burden go much higher, that defense will have to take in quotes, too big a reduction. Mm -hmm. I, th I think uh, for those of you who are here this morning uh, with Secretary Lynn, he, in his remarks, uh, fully acknowledged that, you know, that, that, the, that defense is going to have to, you know, be part of this solution. Didn't talk about magnitude, but, but clearly it's been socialized and, you know, the president's already put a number out there. Uh, and, and, and I guess on the going off the cliff or the train wreck kind of thing, is, it's, uh, you know, uh, there are different sized cliffs. You know, you can survive some, some you can't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but this one has the potential to, I think, be a pretty rough landing again if, if folks aren't paying attention. That's right. Uh, just very briefly, I think the frame of reference you've, you've, you've uh, contrasted here is dead on. I mean, this is a very different world than the one we looked at uh, 20 years ago because of not only the dynamics that we've talked about here in terms of base force and so forth, but because of the, 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 the budgetary challenges to the United States at that time were dominantly more or led folks to focus more on discretionary spending. Today it's a small fraction of what we're spending. It is, but it is the first time in any serious way, I, mean, I shouldn't say it that way, this, this is the first time in, in, a, in a serious way in which we see real um, horsepower behind it that the Congress and the administration appear to be really aggressively looking at the question of how do we address entitlements. There's lots of lip service to it over the last 20 odd years. Several really noble attempts to try to take it on. And this is the first time you see some real generated energy that may do that. And if that happens, then rather than be the panel of pessimists, <laughs> We've got an opportunity here to rationalize uh, the entitlement programs in a way that hasn't been for the last couple of decades at least. That said, failure to do it that way turns out to be David's scenario. Defense gets kind of crushed in the sequence because of the fair share arguments and all this nonsense that in turn will you know, really obliterate any rationale on that. So. Um, hopeful that, yes, indeed, we see the, the energy that's behind the entitlement reform objectives that are underway right now. And if that happens, you've got a different scenario we yep. could be painting. That's true. I'm going to give the last question to Ray Dubois. We've got a mic right over here, Ray. Tomorrow, Leon Panetta appears before the Senate Armed Services Committee for his confirmation hearing. And Assuming he's confirmed 21 days later, he becomes Secretary of Defense. I'd like to ask each one of you 
were he to call you in and say, what are the two, possibly three most important issues that I, as Secretary, as the new Secretary of Defense, must concentrate on intellectually, policy-wise, my energy in my first six months in office, mm -hmm. what are those two or three issues? I'll give each one, because we're, we're on a, each one. one issue. Yep. Uh, again, I'll go back to the strategy framework. It is imperative that they frame the debate by the time the January budget's released. It has to be framed, in, and it's got to have a, a frame of reference to it that will establish exactly what the strategy objectives should be and therefore what, what will flow from that in terms of capabilities. Mine would be, Secretary, uh, as it's presently constructed and, and, and with its size, your all volunteer force is unaffordable. Mm -hmm. So you've got to think about that. And I would think the other side of that coin, which is how do I sustain the quality and morale of this force? Yeah. Because it's the quality and performance of the people, whatever size the force is, in my judgment, which is successful performance depends. And that was the big difference, as Sean points out, in the 1989 to 93 period of time relative to past drawdowns and deliberate. Mm -hmm. right. uh, including, as Sean pointed out, for the first time we paid people to leave because we had gotten them to join as volunteers. And so we owed them a fair transition back to civil life of a different kind than had been true before. So I would pay first attention to the people in the force, because if they don't stick with you, if the institution is broken, mm -hmm. I think that's latent in Ron's comments as well, all the rest of this is academic. Ray, I know you directed it to those guys, but let me offer the one, <laughs> the one thing I would say to the secretary designate is there are four people that are going to make a difference with his success, and they're the chiefs of the services. Uh, the coherence of any plan is going to depend on their goodwill to work with him to come up with it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else in the department is a supplicant. Uh, they're supplicants in one sense, but they also have the responsibility of balancing people and installations and yeah. procurement, and the future, the present. I mean, they are the ones that they are indisputably his essential partners to make it work. And, and making that partnership viable for the next 18 months would be, I think, his highest priority. Collectively and individually, we're very powerful going to yep. turn yep. mm -hmm. Listen, folks, thanks so much for staying, and please reward these guys with your applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.